Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's a pleasure to have David Grangier here today from uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne. He's fin finishing his PhD with Sami Bengio, who's been sucked up by Google. Awesome. <laughs> um, used to be at Lausanne. Uh, he's visiting for a couple of days. If you'd like to talk with him, let us know. We have a few spare slots. Uh, David's going to talk about discriminative kernel-based methods for image retrieval. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So we we'll talk about um, retrieval of images from text queries today. Um, I will first uh, briefly introduce myself. So yeah, so Chris was right. I'm, I'm finishing my PhD. So during this uh, work, I I mostly work on information uh, retrieval uh, task, working on machine learning for information retrieval. So I worked on ranking problems. Uh, we have this uh, setup where we should generalize to both new queries and new documents. And it's typically a highly unbalanced problem. So uh, I had relied always on uh, discriminative learning using efficient online optimization techniques. And I work with uh, neural networks and kernel machines. Uh, we targeted different applications, such as text retrieval from text queries, image retrieval from text queries, and keyword spotting, which can also be formalized as audio search uh, from spoken or written keyword queries. So in this talk, we'll talk about uh, image retrieval. So uh, this talk is, um, is uh, originated from a joint work with uh, Sami Benjo, who is with now with Google. So we'll first uh, start by uh, defining the task, what is uh, image retrieval from text queries. We'll then see uh, what are the standard approaches to this problem. They are mostly based on annotation of images. Then uh, we'll propose our solution. We'll see the model parameterization, its uh, training objective, and uh, the optimization procedure we use for training. And then we'll uh, compare this strategy uh, with previous work on some um, stock photography data. We'll end with some conclusions. So uh, what is this task, uh, image retrieval from uh, text queries? So basically, uh, you're interested in this central uh, black box, uh, which takes as input a set of pictures and a query, and outputs a ranking in which the, the relevant pictures should appear above the others. So formally, the input is a set of picture and a query. The output is a picture ranking. So well, it's a ranking problem. We have generally a highly unbalanced setup. By that, I mean that we have a uh, very few relevant picture per query compared to the size of the whole corpus. So as I said previously, we need to generalize to both new queries and new pictures. And we also would like the model to scale to large training set and to be applied then at testing to large data sets as well. So that's the challenges we are facing. So what is the standard way to address this problem? So there's mainly uh, three types of approach that all rely on annotation. There's the manual annotation approaches, uh, the generative models for automatic annotation, and um, classification for automatic annotation. So in the case of uh, manual annotation, it's the idea is to solve the image retrieval problem by using a text retrieval engine. So you assume that each picture is annotated with uh, some text, which that we call the caption. And the caption is used as a proxy of the image in a text retrieval search engine. So uh, this is, for example, widely used in web search, where the text surrounding a picture is used as the caption and is used instead of the picture in the text uh, search engine. It is also used by uh, stock photography providers uh, that typically annotate all their uh, images. So uh, maybe for those of you who are not familiar, so stock photography uh, are companies uh, like Corbis, for example, who have a huge catalog of pictures. And their, uh, their economic model is to sell those pictures to 
uh, advertisers or publisher. So they are also they are also facing this uh, this image search problem. So I introduced that because then we will be relying on that kind of data for evaluation. So basically, the advantage here is that well, it's effective. You can uh, try it on web search and see that somehow you you get to find uh, what you are looking for. Hopefully, unfortunately, of course, it relies on manual annotation, so they may not always be available. For example, I guess that your uh, vacation picture are not carefully annotated with all that you can find on each image. And also the annotation uh, are typically uh, produced in some specific concept, context, sorry, and they are generally incomplete or biased towards a specific use. So it would be better also to have a more uh, uh, generic annotation. So that's it for the manual annotation. So to circumvent this uh, lack of uh, annotation, some people have proposed to rely on automatic annotation. So basically the goal is to uh, learn a model from a set of uh, pictures which are uh, annotated and then these models can be applied to any picture without caption. There's mainly uh, two types of approach to this uh, problem, learning problem. So the bimodal uh, generative models and uh, binary classifiers for annotation. So in the, in the generative framework, basically what you're working with is that you try to uh, model the joint picture caption distribution. And you learn the parameters of this distribution uh, to maximize the training data likelihood, so the, the likelihood of the pair picture caption. Then when you get a test picture, uh, you can either infer the most likely caption for this picture, or you can infer the distribution of all the vocabulary for this picture. So there are different uh, models that have been introduced in this context. They mainly differ in the way they model the dependencies between the visual and textual features. So here I put uh, some of them and I will use uh, them in the experimental comparison afterwards. So also, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So, so yeah. So the the question was, uh, so so so, uh, yes. So basically, at test time, we 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 have uh, only visual features of the image, and we'll uh, infer some uh, probability distribution about the textual vocabulary. So you learn stuff like if it's very blue, then it might be a C. Five. Yeah, that's that's correct. If if you have color features, probably you would have a a very high, uh, a very high correlation between blue and sky, or things like that. So, if you're searching your own pictures, would be even more likely to search for sea and sky, or like specific people or specific places. Yeah, that's that's the point. So, so you have to have uh, features that that could accommodate to much more complex uh, concepts, such as. So, maybe yeah. So, the approach I'm talking about here is uh, targeted to. Uh, generic concept, so it, it would not uh, recognize some specific person, but you, you can have uh, much more refined co concepts such as, I don't know, uh, uh, so landscape types or also uh, obje specific objects such as, I don't know, cars, computers, any kind of, of common names basically. So we'll see some examples of, of what, are, what is the vocabulary. So that's it for the for the generative uh, framework. So also some people have worked uh, in a in a classification framework to this annotation problem. So basically, in 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 this case, what what you, what what is done is that you consider that each vocabulary term is a binary classification problem, and given a picture, you should predict whether the term uh, should be present or not in the caption. So. What you do is that you, 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 for each term, you learn a binary classifier, minimizing the classification error. And then when you have a test picture, you can test this picture against each vocabulary term. 
So this approach um, is widely used, for example, at TrekVid, which is the, um, a benchmark uh, competition on the retrieval of video and images. And people typically rely on support vector machines for that. Also, uh, approaches based on boosting have been applied in this context. So, yeah. What kind of size is it? Is that for these guys? Because it sounds awfully slow for a web search application. Sorry? It sounds slow for a, for a web search. What kind of data set size is it? Yeah, so um, I have some, actually, I, I report some, I evaluate uh, SVM um, over a two, some 2,000 word vocabulary, like 10,000 images, something like that. It's it's still okay for um, then it all depends on on what you what are your features for example if if you have uh, sparse features the the testing is not that costly but it's true that with those approaches the the learning is is very slow because you have well you have to train on one SVM for each term over a large data set and SVM training is is not that fast yes so I thought you and Viola didn't do annotation I thought they were doing uh, relevant feedback. It's the. They were selecting. You have a bunch of returns, and you select. I like these and not those, and you get more of the same. There was no annotation. No, no. There was another paper where they, where they have this uh, this kind of um, of convolutional net. It was it was not convolutional net because it was based on two layer how features, sure. and they were reporting. Ah, yeah, yeah, you're right. So there were two, actually, there were two, in the journal version, there were two sections. One of them was on annotation, and one of them was on feedback. I see. The conference paper was only on. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, it can obviously be applied in both contexts. People try structured prediction for that, because it seems like it's prime for structured prediction, where the output space has all these big codependencies. Uh, have people tried? Sorry. Structured prediction, so where they, um, instead of individual binary classifiers, try to predict multiple terms at the same time. So yeah. in the output space, you're considering multiple Yeah, terms. Actually, not in, the, um, not in the discriminative framework. For the, for, the, for the generative models, basically, when I say they differ on the way they model dependencies, it's, it's specifically yeah, that the, the parameterization is. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. I'm not aware in the, in, the, in the discriminative framework, I'm not aware of work that are really exploiting, like, I don't know, term dependencies or also. So yeah, so that's that's it for the for the classification framework of automatic annotation. So uh, basically, we see that in both cases, this automatic annotation solves the problem that we don't need manual annotation for all the picture we want to apply the retrieval uh, to. However, here we also see that the learning focus on an intermediate task, the annotation, and that the learning process um, aim at optimizing either the training data likelihood or the per-term classification error, and they are not optimizing uh, something related to the final uh, performance you get at the end on the ranking. And that's why we, we would like to introduce a new approach that would directly uh, look at the ranking performance and select the parameters according to a criterion uh, related to, to this ranking objective. So to, to introduce this approach, we will first see the, the model uh, parameterization, how we rank images. Then we'll see the learning objective and then the training procedure. So our goal is to uh, learn a model to optimize the retrieval performance. And that is to say that we want to, to learn from a set of training queries along with uh, the corresponding relevance assessment. So relevance assessment is, is basically the data that, that, that that would uh, report in your corpus which uh, picture are relevant for each query. So we want to take this training data and learn the model to optimize uh, the performance on these queries. So for that, we first introduced a parametric function for image ranking. It's inspired for, from text retrieval. Then uh, we rely on a loss that would measure how far this parametric function is from uh, an ideal ranking. This is adapted from a uh, ranking SVM. And then once we have this loss function, we should uh, select the parameter uh, that would minimize this loss. And for that, we rely on a scalable training procedure 
It's an online learning algorithm uh, based on uh, Comic Kramer's and colleagues' uh, passive aggressive algorithm. And so the conjunction of those three, those three aspects is called a passive aggressive model for image retrieval. So let's start with the parametric approach to uh, image ranking. So, so a ranking approach is quite classical in the, in the, in the retrieval uh, community. So what we do is that given a query, we assign a real valued score to each picture, relying on this function f. And then we rank the picture by decreasing scores. So one way to see this function is that it would it somehow express the match between the query and the picture. So formally, this, this function takes a, a, a text vector, the query, from the text space, uh, the picture, which is a vector from the picture space, and output a real value. The parameterization is, is like this. So we have we have this um, parameter matrix, which is size of the text space times size of the picture space. And we simply compute this uh, matrix product. So one way to interpret this uh, simple parameterization is that first we use uh, W to compute WP, which uh, would project the picture into the text space. And then we compute the dot product matching between the Q and this new uh, textual vector WP. So th that's it for the parameterization. So it's a linear parameterization. We'll see that we can then extend it to nonlinear models through kernels. So now we have this parameterization. We should uh, look at O to select W. We have to recall that we want the relevant picture to appear above the other for any query. And also, we, we remember that we rank the picture by decreasing score. So basically, this translates that we would have a function f that uh, achieves perfect performance if for any query, the score of any relevant picture is greater than the score of any non-relevant picture. So now, if we are given some uh, training data. So this is kind of assume that relevance is binary. Relevant or non -relevant. Yeah, that's correct. It can be extended to non. Uh, so in this talk, it's only binary relevance. It can be extended to non-relevance, to, to no, sorry, to non-binary relevance, because uh, we could inst uh, introduce uh, some different classes uh, of relevance with an ordering among the classes. Are you thinking of relevant feedback? I mean, are, are you thinking of doing it sort of in the lab where you sort of cook up the best W for sky and C and all that stuff? Or are you thinking about putting it on sort of a user's computer and saying, okay, if I want uh, a particular set of hikes or something that I did with Chris, then I'll learn the W for the hikes and I'll give it relevant feedback for the hikes. I'm not sure what yeah. you set up here. Well, yeah, w so far we worked on uh, offline setup. So we have the train data, we learn one model, and we apply this to the test set without uh, updating in during the user using the system. Uh, also, we'd like to mention that we, we learn one single model for, for all queries. We, we have a, a, a very large set of training data, and we learn this... Um, so we don't learn one model for, I don't know, IX and one model for, for other concepts. We, we learn one single model. It's not, it's not like classification. Here the input is both the query and the picture. So we, we learn one single uh, model f to accommodate all queries. Maybe it will be clearer okay. uh, later. <laughs> so, so basically that, that's... So if, if, we, if we satisfy those, those, condi those uh, conditions here, we would have a perfect ranker. And so if we are given some training data, that is to say, uh, a set of queries, a set of pictures, and the relevance assessment that, uh, that shows which picture is relevant to which query, we, 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 we would like to minimize the number of constraints which are unsatisfied. So we just rephrase that 
saying that we want to have all constraints satisfied like that. So we want to minimize this loss. So this would not be, uh, however, very convenient to minimize that directly, because basically here the, you can see that the derivative with respect to w is zero everywhere. So we we'll rely classically on an upper bound. So for that we we introduce this hinge loss. So basically it's, a, it's the hinge loss over the score difference. So we look whether this difference is greater than one. If it is, uh, we don't suffer any loss. And if it is not, we suffer uh, a loss inversely proportional to this uh, difference. And it is actually an upper bound on the number of uh, non-satisfied constraints. So this means that if we minimize this loss, it would mechanically, mechanically minimize the number of non-satisfied constraints. So that's it for the loss. So now, uh, if we are given some training data, we have to find an uh, efficient way to minimize uh, this loss. So for that, we rely on uh, passive aggressive training, which is uh, an uh, online algorithm that examines the training data sequentially. So at each uh, iteration, you, you are updating uh, the, the, the weight matrix according to uh, one example you have in hand. So by one example, I mean you get a triplet, which is uh, a query, a relevant picture, and a non-relevant picture. So for each triplet, the update is performed as a trade-off between uh, remaining close to the previous weight and minimizing the loss over the current triplet. So formally, it is expressed like that. So we would select the next weight as a trade-off between here. We said that we want to stay close to the previous weight. Here we said that we want to uh, satisfy the current constraint. And here we set the trade-off between those two objectives. So this problem has actually a closed form solution that will not detail here. It's written uh, here. And so the advantage of this procedure is that uh, it's, 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 it's very efficient, it's, it's very scalable, uh, because at each step, you simply uh, examine one example. It's, it's not like, uh, for instance, SMO, which is used to, uh, to train uh, SVM, where you would have, so we don't perform any search. We just take the example we, we currently have in hand, and we don't look for the direction of greatest gradient, etc. And also, we, we, we will uh, see later that Basically, this minimal update rule um, is a kind of margin maximization mechanism that theoretically ensure uh, good generalization properties. So to summarize, we've seen a parametric function for image ranking. We've seen um, a loss uh, related to retrieval performance. And we see an efficient uh, procedure to minimize this loss of a large data set. Yes. Yes. Right. So you're going to update those words in W? That way it works? Yeah, so, so W. Have been so, yeah, so obviously for each. So, one way to see that is that for, for each. So, for each query, you would. So, if you use. I, I will speak about data representation later, but. So, we use the bag of words representation. So, this means this query would be a vocabulary size vector. And each line would be related, would be the weight relate, each, each, each line of the weight matrix would be related to one term. So this means that when we, okay? Mm -hmm. So this means that when we, when, when we compute this or when we perform the update, uh, what we do is that basically if, if we have this sparse uh, back of word vector, we will update uh, basically the lines that corresponds to the query words. That means you are updating the model that corresponds to those words. Yeah, that's. And so you are building something specific to those words. I, I'm building. Yeah, I have. I have. In this matrix, each line is specific to one word. Yeah. Right. So, but before you said you weren't doing something specific to each individual query term, and now you're saying you are updating. Yeah. Yeah. I I didn't phrase it correctly. So what I want to say is that we we would learn all those weights jointly. This means that. This allows us, for example, to train for multiple word queries. 
or to train from a data set which has many multiple work queries with different degree of overlap. But if I have a query that wasn't in your training set, you're out of luck. If you have a query whose which words are not in the training set, then yeah, I'm lost. Yeah, yeah. So we assume that we work in a, in some kind of closed vocabulary, which is anyway it is reasonable if we because we will use uh, stemming, which means that basically the 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 set of 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 words you get reasonably in an English uh, corpus would be of the order of ten thousand. If we exclude of course, if we exclude the, the proper names. So if I search for uh, John Platt, I would be out of luck, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, 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 this, is, this is in the conclusion. We, we can also plug some, some kind of, if, if you have another matrix that would, uh, I don't know, express, for example, the, the type of correlation you would have between terms, mm -hmm. you, you can also uh, in, insert this matrix in between Q and W here, for instance if you want to model more finely the world dependencies. OK, so. What is the typical dimensionality of these? So, Just yeah, so basically, um, so actually I will, I will say that we can kernelize this part. But I if we use lin, then in the end I will, I will end. So we, uh, you will see that later, maybe. So, but it's the order of, of the 10,000, something like that. So it's a very big parameter matrix. But what is, what is good here is that uh, if you have sparse representation here and sparse representation there, it's, uh, although the matrix is very big, it's very fast to evaluate. But, but what about, about overtraining? I mean, I mean, you can throw it really heavily. Yeah, so I, I would, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So I talk about regularization in uh, actually, so in there. So it's just next point is, 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 is regularization. So, so, so yeah, so we have presented the model. So we have this uh, further analysis slides where we'll see why it is a large margin or how it is regularized, if you want. And then we'll see also how it can be extended to nonlinear parametrization. So for the, for the large margin aspect, so, so first we will suppose that we are in the feasible case and then we'll, uh, which is more a theoretical uh, case, and then we'll see what happens when, when it's non-feasible. So, so by feasible, I mean that there exists uh, a set of weights, matrix, uh, such that the loss would be zero. So this means that if we, if we look at the definition of the loss, that basically we have this, for all training triplets, we have this condition which holds. If we inject the definition of F, we get this. So now we will introduce a normalized version of u, which is basically uh, u over the matrix uh, Frobius norm. And then we'll see that basically the difference between um, so the, 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 the difference between those two scores is at least greater than 1 over norm of w. So, and we call this uh, the margin between score difference. And so if, if we assume, for, I for instance, that we, we, we inject uh, Gaussian noise on both the query and the picture representation, we can show that we have uh, better generalization guarantees if we focus on, on solution with large margin, that, that is to say solution with small W norm. So hence, this suggests to use uh, the norm of W as a regularizer. And we've, we've not seen yet how it is done in passive-aggressive. And we will get to there. So imagine now we are in the non-feasible case. So there's no such a solution. So we've, we now focus on a trade-off between uh, minimizing the loss and maximizing the margin. And how we do that in, uh, in, the, concept of in the context of passive-aggressive? Actually, this, this is controlled by the number of iterations. It is a little bit like early stopping in the case of neural network. So basically, we can show that during training, uh, the loss is decreasing, while at the same time, an upper bound on the norm of W is increasing. So this means that uh, if we select the number of training iterations uh, through validation, that is to say we monitor the, 
the performance of a, over a set of held out data. And we stop, we select then the, the base trade-off between those two objectives in this way. I have also to say that in practice, we don't see much overtraining basic with the data representation and the data set we used, etc. So what we see is that the performance tend, tend to cap, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really uh, fold on or, or, or we are not looking at the right scale and we should train for ages before we observe that. Yeah. Kind of yeah. 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 This is this is the case. So it can be seen as. Um, so if you look at so one good way to s to look at passive aggressive is that if we look at the margin uh, perceptron, so like the perceptron algorithm where you perform the update if uh, if you don't get the correct signs with a margin of one as well, okay. So it's like the perceptron, but you have this, this notion of, of one margin. So in fact, passive aggressive in this case would be that the exact same algorithm, except that if you're in the case where you perform an update, you allow yourself to perform a more conservative update. Instead of adding the training example itself, you can add um, the, the training example times a learning rate, which is smaller than one just up to go to the point where the constraint would be satisfied. So in the basically, to summarize, in the margin perceptron algorithm, when, when the margin is related, you just had the training example. In passive aggressive, you had the training example with uh, a learning rate smaller or equal to one, and it will be smaller to one if we can satisfy the constraint before uh, making the full update. So what I was saying is, <laughs> it's difficult to see on this slide, what I was saying is, is in there. So if, if you look at, so you can look at, uh, how to say, so it's diff <laughs> I haven't put much equation, so I'm in difficulty. So if you look at, at C here, uh, imagine C is one, okay? Because anyway, you can scale the, the other parts so that you get what you want. So basically, in the case of, of the, um, of the of the margin perceptron, you will perform the full update all the time. Whereas in the other case, you will just move uh, in there up to the point uh, to which the constraint is satisfied. Ah, so it would actually be a Bregman projection. In other words, if you always do that, then it would be a Bregman projection if you show that you're minimizing the, the norm of W. Uh, okay, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. So yeah, so it's one way to, to look at uh, passive aggressive training. Okay. But it's always doing Bregman. It's always doing Bregman projection. Yeah. So the the oh. yeah yeah the norm will grow, but the update is bounded. So this means that when you control the number of iteration, you control the norm because you make only bounded update. Mm -hmm. Oh, because it's not it's not feasible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. We see that the <laughs> in there, in there, we we said that basically w the the norm is increasing during training. Well, it's not the norm which is increasing; it's an upper bound on the norm because the the update is uh, bounded. Okay. So yeah. So that's it for the large margin aspect. We can also s look at. Uh, or we can extend this to uh, nonlinear models uh, using kernels. So if, if, if we imagine we have, a, we have an, an effective uh, picture kernel, that is a, to say a way to compare two pictures, uh, which would uh, verify some uh, mathematical properties. Which so, so this is a kernel, so this ensures that this is basically a dot product in a space uh, you don't have access to. It is still possible to learn a Pamir model in that space. So we replace this linear parametrization by this linear parametrization in this new space. So we don't have access to phi, but nevertheless, we can compute 
uh, both the, the model output because we only need to evaluate this W phi. And in fact, W will be a, a linear combination of training example if you look at the update. So this basically means that we can rely on kernel over between pictures. So of course, in this case, it would be uh, you would need to maintain uh, one support set per uh, line in the matrix. I don't mention it here that we could also kernelize the the query space as well, but it's so common to use uh, linear kernels in text that I didn't even bother to write it in there. So basically, we can benefit from effective uh, picture kernels. So that's it for the model. So we, we've seen uh, we've seen the models. We've seen this uh, little analysis section. So now we can uh, move to uh, the um, experimental part, where we'll we'll be comparing our model to alternatives. So we we'll, we first start with the with the data representation. We then uh, look at what type of data we used, and we then uh, present the evaluation methodology. So for the, for the data representation, for, for, for the queries, we use the standard bag of word uh, representation. So I don't know, maybe everybody's, well, I will, I will go through that quickly. So basically, in this representation, each query is represented with a vocabulary size vector. So you assume that you worked uh, with a closed vocabulary that can be very large, like you extracted from the, from a web index, for example. Then, uh, in, in this query, each component is related to the presence or absence of a term. The each component of this query vector is called the weight of term i in the query. And basically, here we, we use a, a weighting scheme that would uh, give more weight to more weight to the to the discriminant rare terms. So, for example, I will I will give uh, more weight to to um, I don't know the specific name of mountain compared to uh, an article or a pronoun. So that's it for the query representation. So we have this huge uh, bag of word vector, which is sparse because here this weight is basically zero if the word is not present in the query. Then for the picture representation, um, there's not much of a consensus on what is the good representation to perform a retrieval. Uh, on images, so there's the different kind of approaches. Um, in the vision community, there seems to be a convergence towards um, using set of local descriptors. So this kind of approach uh, divide the picture extraction in two steps. First, you would um, detect in the image some uh, area or point of interest, and then you would uh, describe uh, each of this area according to some uh, statistics extracted from the pixel, pixels themselves. So here are a few examples of, of, of representation we, we, we evaluated. Then uh, using this representation, we, we have uh, an image which is now a set of local descriptors. So I mean a set. So also, I, I forgot to say that, that this, this kind of representation would typically uh, neglect the spatial ordering of the of the local descriptors, even if it's not always true, because it's always possible to to put some uh, some reference uh, to the to the to the location in in this region descriptor. So basically, now we have a set of of vectors which represent an image, and we look for kernel over sets to compare uh, two pictures. So there's different approaches that, that have been proposed in parallel to the development of local descriptor-based approach. So here we evaluated a few. Um, so today I will not focus a lot on, on this vision aspect. So I will, I will present only the, the, the best combinations. So the next slide explains how we use uh, this term kernel over blocks. So the, the block representation is very simple. In fact, when, when I was doing this work, I I try different kind of, of 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 local descriptors that have been introduced in uh, for different tasks. Basically, they have been introduced for uh, matching two views of the same object or different kinds of of of, ta of vision tasks. And people have tend to use them directly for for picture representation. 
Then I, I went to something very simple, which is that. And this happens to work the best, so I, I will only describe this. So, so what you do first is that you, you take your picture. You divide it into overlapping square blocks, very simple. Then each block is described with a color and edge histogram. So for edge, we use this uh, LBP representation, which is uh, some way to be robust to lightning variations, illumination changes, etc. So then we have an image which is a set of uh, color and edge histogram. What we do is that we will uh, quantize each block. So each block will be uh, assign a discrete index. This is this is done using a, a set of centroids. So basically, what we do is that we we learn those centroids over um, the, the the blocks extracted from the training data through k-means. Then we have this set of centroid. So this means that we can quantize uh, the block within the both the training and testing pictures. So then the image is just a, a set of discrete index. It would it would map just to a cluster index, so we 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 don't know what it means. It's, it's just learned through k-means, so it's some kind of density modeling. Uh, yeah. How, how big are the blocks? So, yeah. So we validated that, and it happens to be that it would work. <laughs> I don't remember exactly, but like something like thirty by thirty or. Oh, so tiny, it's a tiny little block. Yeah, tiny little block. So it's it's. Um, so how big are so it's like, so we do actually, yeah. So yeah, I have to mention something else. <laughs> You're right. So uh, actually, the image were like uh, 300 by, let's say 300 by 300. Oh, I, so I don't remember. Images. Yeah. Or do you, you downsample? So what we do, what we did, so so for the for the experiment of our coil data that I present here, all the images have the same size. Then we apply to uh, also to web data. In this case, we can have any kind of images. So in this case, we would, this is not what I presented here. So in this case, we would just don't say sample. So we would extract uh, the blocks at one scale, then extract at another scale, etc., And then carefully weight the blocks such that each scale have the same weight so that we don't have, uh, I don't know, the, the very large image that would account for, for much more blocks than a small image. Sorry. So edge histogram is um, so we use this LBP features. So basically, on each pixel of the block, you perform a set of binary tests where we, you compare the, um, the the center pixel to its neighbor, <coughs> and then you assign uh, different um, how to say different different edge code to to according to those binary tests. So. Yeah. Uh, the blocks are fixed, right? Every, every picture gets the same sort of blocks. So yeah. So in the case of coil data, is it's 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 you mean the the block the centroid? The size of each block. Yeah. So so for the coil data, it's the case for the when we apply that to web data, basically we we would use the same size of block, but we were done sampling the image. So actually, it's it's like if the block have varying size. It depends where if you see it as scaling the image or scaling the blocks. So so this I didn't put a slide on LBP features. Actually I removed it. I should have put it. So basically what what I don't know if the camera sees yeah, maybe I will I will write it down, it will be easier. So basically what we what we do is that we have a center pixel, we look at some neighbors. So what we use is that we use um, eight direction. So let's say there's eight points here. Actually, it is not. <laughs> OK. So uh, we have a radius of two. We look at binary tests. So we look whether it would, be, it would be greater or smaller than this central pixel. And then what we do is that we, we represent each pixel as, as this sequence of bits that we read out here. And the LBP representation suggests to basically discard some of those patterns because they are not discriminative. It's, 
it has been introduced by uh, people working on, on texture uh, recognition. So, but this is the basic idea. So, you, you, you look at, at, for each pixel, you look at the, at, at the center position. You look at the, at the gray value around here. You only report binary tests, which allow to be robust to illumination changes because binary tests are quite robust. And then you have, you, you have your edge type like, like that. And you discard some, some, some types of edge because they, are, they have been shown not to be discriminative on texture uh, recognition tasks. Then it's not rotational integrated yet. Um, yes, that's correct. And, and with your bag and bit strips, you don't care where the blocks occur in the image. Yes, that's correct. I I tried. I validate that as well. I tried to to in the in the block descriptor. I tried to put as well the coordinate of the block, or some uh, also some quantized version of the coordinate. Like is it uh, above? Is it on the Top above, bottom above, and and then uh, short, m more refined quantization of this position, and this did not help, at least on my uh, pictures. Okay, so so after the yeah, some more question? No, okay. So after the the quantization step, so we have just a set of discrete index, and what we do then is that we do exactly the same thing as for text. So a text is is for a search engine, it's like a, a set of, of, of discrete vocabulary entries. So in there, what we d so we, we just assign a, a TF-IDF weighted vector in there. So a bag of word vector. So basically, um, we have just a sparse histogram of the type of blocks that would appear in the, in the image. And we use the linear kernel over that. So I, I, will, I, will, I will just say that Basically, the, what we call the block representation is from here to there. And what we call the VSTORM kernel is the fact to quantize the blocks and then rely on bag of word representation. And to answer your question, so typically we use like of the order of 10,000 uh, cluster. For We also validated this number. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, so in the end, we have a very large sparse vector that represents each picture. So that's it for the picture representation. So we have the query representation, picture representation. Now, uh, the data we use in this uh, work is uh, stock photography data. It's, uh, it comes from uh, Corel. So we first use a first uh, small set of 5,000 pictures uh, which, which is a kind of uh, benchmark in the literature. It has been widely used. It comes with a standard split into uh, training and tests. So this means that the results reported on this set are directly comparable with other papers. And then to look at uh, scalability, we also use the, the whole coral set, which is uh, roughly 35,000 pictures. So those pictures are, um, are very... Um, there's many kinds of picture, so you, you can get like like that kind of landscape picture, also those those kind of of tourist like pictures. You you also get some some I don't know picture of foods, I very I very different types. It's it's mainly intended for uh, advertisers. So imagine anything you you would see in a advertisement. So yeah. What are the queries? So yeah, so for the queries, I I have to I have to explain that. So so yeah, for the queries, what we did is that we don't have queries because we are not a search company. So what we did is that we 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 use so all the um, image come with a caption, and what we said is that we 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 stated this rule of relevance is that one picture is relevant to a query if all the query terms appear in the caption. So, so this assumption uh, may underestimate relevance because if you have some term missing, so I don't know. So if you have, for example, uh, I don't know, beach, uh, sky, and I don't know, surfers. So in the caption, you would, you would be relevant to beach sky, beach surfers, sky surfers, things like that. So, 
Yeah, so, so those captions have been produced by professional annotators uh, by the coal companies for the basically their customer to search within the database. That's another of like a couple to 10, 20 a month. Yeah, it's not, I it's true that it's incomplete. It's like, um, I don't remember exactly, maybe five or eight words. So, so this, this is, this rule basically, so surely I, I think we do, we do, we, we, we don't have false positive. I mean, we don't consider uh, a picture uh, as relevant while it is not. Because if the words are there, I mean, they have been put by the annotators. But it's true that we may underestimate the relevant set because basically the annotators have not put all possible words that you can come up with. So, 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 yeah, okay. So then what we do is that we just take all queries that have at least one relevant document according to this rule. Yeah, so we, so all, all, all caption subsets have been used. In the power set of all caps? Yeah, so it's why we get big numbers here. Yeah, yeah so then also, so, so this experience on Corel, so on Corel data, uh, it was the best I could do without queries. Then I, 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 I did an internship at Google and what I realized is that this method is, is okay for uh, generating the queries. The problem is that you don't have a, a prior of a queries. And the distribution is quite different in the reality. But, <laughs> if you, but, but still the, the result I get on Google data where the distribution was the exact uh, grade distribution that the user would, would give uh, the results were, were pretty much consistent with what we see there. But it's true that the distribution is a bit screwed by this power set generation procedure. Okay, so that's it for the data. I would just like to mention that, so we have this small set which is benchmark and widely used and this large set uh, which is much more challenging. In, so it's, it's, it's more challenging not only because it is big but also because uh, we basically have fewer relevant pictures uh, per query in the training. Here we have uh, 5.3, here we have 3.8. And we have a, a, a bigger set of images. So we have to basically look for smaller needles in a bigger S stack. So it's a much more challenging set and you will see that the results are, are, are not as high on this set than on the other one. So that's it for, that's it for the data. So yeah, also the vocabulary size, here we have approximately 200 words and here we have 2,000 words. We can scale to much larger vocabulary. When we apply to web size data, we have like something like millions of pictures and an order of 10,000 uh, words. But I don't report results on that because it's Google internal. Um, so for the evaluation, we rely on um, on average precision and uh, precision at top 10, and we compare those results uh, to uh, the alternative method we've seen previously. So um, maybe some of you are not familiar with those evaluation measures, so here is a, is, is a very quick introduction. So precision at top 10 would evaluate the, the percentage of relevant material you get in the top 10 position of the ranking, which is pretty much uh, related to the experience of the user looking at the first page results. Then um, the average precision is related to the precision versus recall curve. So, so the precision, I just defined it. So recall would measure the number of relevant picture ranked above a certain position over the total number of relevant picture. And you can plot basically uh, precision as a function of recall. And you have curve like that. Basically the ideal point is in there where you would fill the whole uh, graph with this area. And the average precision corresponds to the area under this curve. So it's a measure of goodness, the higher the better. So basically, if you're not familiar with those measures, precision at top 10 would emphasize the top of the ranking where people mostly look at. And average precision is more synthetic measure of the whole ranking. So that's it for the setup. So we can now look at the results. So here we report the results over the small set and the large set. We see that 
uh, our model compare uh, favorably with uh, the alternative approaches. So how, how, yeah. how are the queries for the test that's being generated? The same as the for the for the. So what we did is that we 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 split the set first into image for training, image for validation, image for test. Then once we have done this split, we can generate the queries uh, with this uh, power set rules for each set. So this means that some queries are present in in uh, in both training and test, and some of them are not present in 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 training while being so in testing. Yeah, no correct. Reason. Yeah. Yeah, so we measured generalization to new queries as well. Actually, I didn't put those results on this slide. So in the paper, I have also, um, I report separately the results on the queries which are common to training and test, and those were only on tests. But I, yeah, I didn't put this in there. So, um, so yeah, we, we get those kind of results. We look at whether this, uh, improvement reported on the average uh, could be due to a few queries and in fact it was not so it was consistent over the query set we, we use Wilcoxon for, for that so if, if we look at those results so I, I, if, if some of you are from text which result those results could seem uh, a bit low so for example here we get 10% average precision which means that basically in the top 10 uh, on average we get one relevant picture However, we have to consider the difficulty of this task because actually uh, we have like something like 2.7 uh, relevant picture on average on the, on, on the test data, which means that actually if we compute it, the, the optimal performance here would be uh, something around 20%. So this means that someone using our system will retrieve half of the material retrieved by someone having the perfect ranker. Yes, that's correct. That's how oh, I generated it. Yeah. So can you explain how you get the SDM to run on a, on a huge data set? So I understand how the passive aggressive will be efficient in that. But how do you get the SDM to follow? So it's um, the training set is um, the training set is um, fourteen thousand pictures. So it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, you have to do that for each vocabulary terms. In the end, it's quite a long training process, but it's, it's still manageable. I think you're talking about power sets of time. No, no, no. This is, the num this is the number of queries. Yes. So <laughs> okay, okay. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, we have that. I have an answer for you on the next slide. <laughs> Maybe this is also. <laughs> I don't know. I cannot have everything on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> it also seems like you're having now a one to one, or not a one, but you have a very strong correlation between some query foo and now some k mean blocks. And you could identify where in the image the k mean blocks Yeah, blocks. yeah, yeah. Is that interesting? Yeah. I didn't look at that. What I really want to do is uh, the converse. So use this model for annotation. So instead of um, instead of, of saying that the score of a picture should of the relevant picture should be greater, we could say that the score of the word present in the so we look we look exactly at the transpose problem. So and we could use this model for annotation and this would provide localization as well, where we would say that basically that the score of a term present in the image should be greater than the score of a term non present in the annotation. And in this way, this would provide a, um, a good way to do uh, this annotation. And, and, and this would give us as a byproduct the localization as well. I didn't look at those localization results uh, yet. And then you could use regular text 
Yeah, actually we can do that as well in there. Uh, I didn't say it. I, I have that in two slides, actually. <laughs> yeah. You, you, yes, sir? Uh, yeah, so we, d we did pre-processing. We did uh, stemming as a pre-processing. Uh, we didn't handle synonyms in more refined way. Then I'm still confused about the query generation that we do. So is there likely in your test set that there are queries which have words which are not seen in the? No, so the vocabulary is closed. So for all the pictures in the test data, which have uh, new words, those words are discarded, they are not indexed. But it was not much because, well, the correct data tend to overlap quite a bit because basically the, the stock photography provider would not have a single picture on one of the concepts in general. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, yes. In there, yeah. Yeah. Right. This doesn't mean much, so you have to look at the average precision difference. That tells a lot more than. I mean. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's why we report. It's hard to argue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Means anything since, right. Yeah. Actually, that's that's why we put the two. But still, I think it's it's something meaningful because if you look at a small uh, set of pictures, like I don't know, ten thousand pictures, which could be your vacation picture. And you would be searching through it. You would like to look at top 10. I, if you look for, I don't know, Greece or I don't know, some, some place, you would not like to look at uh, 500 pictures to, to find it. So it's still meaningful to, to suggest a cutoff rank after which the user would stop looking at, even if there's few relevance. But then the tasks become much harder than uh, in the web search where there's so many uh, relevance. Yeah. Right. I, I'm a bit annoyed, you know, with the with the precision at some recall level because it somehow suggests that the the user does not know the, the don't know the number the total number of relevant. So it's not something the user would itself experience. I he will not say I will go until I found I don't know 10% uh, of the relevant material, which would be a recall of 10, <coughs> because the user has no knowledge of, of the total number of relevant in the corpus. Well, this is this is a generic retrieval evaluation problem. Okay, so this is just an area for me searching on my computer pictures rather than the web. Yeah. In the web scenario, this doesn't So we. Have a lot of yeah, yeah. So we have we have some results on the on we have some web results as well. I don't report them here because they are from Google data, but still, it's it's not true that you always have a lot of relevant pictures because. Uh, the query distribution tends to be that uh, many people are looking for the same thing. And I don't know, so it would be Eiffel Tower uh, uh, or uh, I don't know, uh, some, some, let's say some places, for example. And there you would have a lot of relevant pictures. But then some people would make very specific uh, requests on, I don't know, I want to see this, this product, I don't know, this, this car in this place, for example. And then you have very few relevant as well. And so you have this kind of long tail distribution where many people look at, look at uh, the same thing. And then although the others search are quite uh, very specific thing with few relevance. So your system will never pick that up anyway, right? That's what, caption, that's what captioning is for. I mean, I mean, you're never going to recognize a Pontiac Firebird in, I don't know, Bratislava or something, right? I mean. <laughs> no. So, so for the. Not gonna say it's anyway. 
true. Yeah, so for the city names, it's true. For, for the cars, we've been surprised that it was quite OK, like some, some kind of car, Mustang, Corvettes, etc. Because there are so much search, you have so much relevant from them, that, that actually y you, you can identify, I don't know, Ferraris or... or s s so some cars, it, 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 would, it, it would work. For, for cities, it, it was not working. For, for some very famous places as well, like Eiffel Tower or, or Statue of Liberty, it, it was working as well, uh, because there's so many people taking the same type of picture with the same uh, uh, type of angles, etc. So it, it was a surprise, but it's true that for, for city names, it's, it's hopeless. I mean, and even if I provide you a, a picture of some European city and I told you, is it uh, Paris or Rome, or <laughs> it would be very difficult. So yeah, so then we look at some, so to answer your question, we look at some uh, further results. So here we have the, I don't remember exactly what was your question, but I remember this was answering your question. So, so here we look at, at the easy queries versus the difficult queries. So, so the easy queries are, are those with more relevant pictures. And then uh, the difficult queries are more specific and have few uh, relevant pictures. And we see that we are doing better on both sets, but we bring a greater improvement on the, on the very specific queries. And in fact, this is not weird. Uh, because uh, what we have is that uh, we have this uh, ranking loss, which is especially su suitable for unbalanced case. It has already, um, so if you look at, at this loss in the case of classification, it's like maximizing the AUC. And it's very uh, useful for unbalanced setup. And, uh, and those queries with very few relevance are very unbalanced problem. Okay. So well, at least that's our explanation. Maybe, maybe you find it weird for some other reason. No, 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 okay, so also we look at this, uh, also the single words versus multiple word queries. Uh, because basically, uh, many people report results only on single word queries. But in real words, there are all kinds of queries. So we see that we bring a greater improvement on the multiple word queries. And in fact, it's not surprising because our model is train, trained jointly the, all the parameters of all the terms. Whereas the, in the case of SVM, you basically learn one model per term and then try to combine them. And it does not ensure that it always works uh, well, this combination. Yeah, it's not really. Yeah, the parameterization doesn't take the dependencies as itself, but still you have a, a notion of, of, of the relative uh, score you should put on each term because we, we, we learn the term jointly. And actually I have some examples where it's particularly clear that, so, so for example, if you look at, so this is on the small set uh, results. So if we look at building cars, for example, for SVM, we see that the, the SVM for cars is very confident for those race pictures because they send they tend all to be in the same angle, etc. So they are very specific. And this completely uh, smears out the, the concept of building because the, the building classifier is less confident. Oh, but, uh, but did you calibrate the SVM? Yeah, so what we did is that we look a, a bit at the, um, at the TrekVid literature and look uh, uh, because it's widely used in TrekVid to learn each of those classifiers. And most people are yeah, basically normalizing the output scores by normalizing mean and variance, and then using that in the, in the, as the weight of the term in the, in the image. So, they, so they, they look at the output of the SVM over the whole set for, for one term. They normalize the mean and variance and put this. Maybe it's not the best way to do, but it's for the all or for only thing with, with things with no, no, no. It's per term normalization. So for the for the building, I will have a mean and variance of the building SVM classifier. Mm -hmm. But overall, but over images that have buildings, images that don't. Yeah. Oh, so we could get totally swamped. Yeah, I don't know if it's the best way. Yeah. Because there, there's some papers that try different way of normalize. This is the weak point of using binary classifiers for this task. Right, but, it, but I mean, that's a subtle engineering thing that might... Yeah, yeah. I don't know because, you know, I, I, I don't think it's proved that, that doing the joint normalization is better. It just could be that the people normalizing the, the SVM just didn't do the right thing. Yeah, yeah th that could be that. But their, remember, their goal is to win the, the track big competition. So if so, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you normalize your score as well, right? 
I did not because my system is natively multiple world uh, enabled because I, I basically have a single model for all the terms. Why is it because of your power set? Is that no, it's not because of the power set. It's because my parametrization is based on a matrix in there. So we have this matrix. So we take the query vector with all its term, multiplied by this matrix, and multiplied by P. So we have this single matrix for all the terms. We have not one model per term. So yeah, so basically it might be an issue of, of correctly normalizing the scores. I agree with you. And the gap isn't that large. So it could be that if they screwed up the, the SVM, you could, you could close the app, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I tried to be fair. I picked the best, uh, the best track vid uh, setup. Uh, maybe there's better things to do, yeah. Yeah, also I thought about that, actually. I thought about initializing the model with something coming from uh, individual classifiers or things like that. But I, I didn't have much time investing on, thing on that. But this is a good point, like starting, to, starting from something learned individually for each term and then uh, refining it with multiple word queries so that it combines nicely. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So then I have a few examples, so we can go quickly through that. Uh, maybe I will. Yeah. Maybe this example is on the large set. So we see that we we have uh, low performance on the large set, but still we see that uh, it can be helpful. Um, so for example, in this query three snow people, we see that the SVM is very dominated by snow. Again, one only one of the concept. Whereas in this case, we find uh, three snow and people here, here, and here. So three out of 13. Even for very difficult uh, case where we have only four relevant pictures out of 10,000, we can here identify uh, two of them. So yeah, the resolution is not that great. <laughs> so here it's, it's zebras. It's, it's difficult to see. So yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. Leave it for the end. OK, OK. So then we have this slide on efficiency. So basically here, oh, sorry. We compare the, so I report indexing and retrieval uh, time separately. So by indexing, I mean uh, it's model training. And then to, and what I call index pre-computation. So to answer uh, Chris' question is that basically we, once we have the, the test picture, we can do part of the computa computation before the user starts interacting with the system, which is good for the response time. So we can start computing the WP in there. And then we just have to in inject the query here once we, we will be uh, at test time. So, so basically at test time, so we are, we are at the retrieval time. We are given the query. We compute the score by, uh, by, by computing the dot product with Q here. And we perform the ranking. So what we see from those time is that we have a very fast model. Here we train on this, where we index only set seven minutes, training plus indexing which is 60 times uh, faster than the SVM, and which is twice as fast as the fastest model, which get quite bad results, as you see previously. And for retrieval, basically, all models perform the same kind of operation, which is a sparse vector dot product. It's very fast. And this, this 8 millisecond time means that, basically, the user can interact with the system without perceiving any delay. So I also mentioned that, uh, so, this summer I was at Google and we applied that to much larger sets. And so with, with the, I don't remember exactly the number of queries we had, but we have around 2 million pictures and, and a lot of queries. And basically we could get a reasonable model training in one day. And then we could refer, further refine. And within, within one week of training, we pretty much converge to, to to the best performance. So, so this, would, this, this, this is perfectly feasible to learn of a very large data set. And once again, the, the queries are generated from <laughs> queries are generated from actual queries or from tags? So in the case of, um, of Google Data, it is, it is, it is um, I don't know what I have the right to say, but it is real queries. Uh, it is, it is, it is uh, it, it is not generated from annotation or so. So it, it is much more realistic, but I cannot report those results, unfortunately. OK, so, so it's scalable, yeah. So 
So in conclusion, we've seen this uh, discriminative model to uh, retrieve images from text queries. Uh, so the learning focus on the final retrieval task. We have this efficient training procedure, uh, which has shown to scale to very large sets. We have uh, good generalization properties, uh, theoretically ensured by uh, the margin mix maximization mechanism. This theoretical advantage actually converts into uh, good experimental results. So we have some uh, future work here that we could investigate. So we, 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 we were looking at ways to parallelize the training on several machines. Also, we would like to um, enforce the sparseness of the parameter matrix. So, so this matrix can grow, grow quite big for real vocabulary and real um, and large, uh, large uh, V-storm sets. And actually having a sparse parameter matrix, that is to say uh, a parameter matrix with lots of components to zero, um, would help reduce the, the size of the picture index, basically. Because if this matrix is sparse, this WP would be sparse. And this is very important to web search companies, because basically this, this picture index should be, should be kept accessible easily, so either in memory or on, on some fast uh, way of storing. And as a future work, we would also like to extend to other loss functions, such as uh, normalize this cumulative gain, which is uh, widely used in the search industry. This is more challenging because the, um, basically the, the training, the online training, um, require to perform some kind of ranking for each query uh, during the training. Well, maybe it's too technical given the time I, I'm, I'm left by. So, so this, is, this is challenging to have something as efficient when, uh, when trying to optimize those measures. So here are some references so on this paper. Also some reference on, on the work I did on text search and search in speech recordings. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any question or comment, In the examples you gave of images, right, you had actually pretty good results for zebras. And, and given how bad the results are overall, so this must be queries that perform very well. So have you looked back at the training data to see how many why this performed so well? So did you have very many examples with zebras in the training or? No, it's not related to the example. So for this specific query, so, so I have this. So when, when I say easy and difficult queries, um, it also corresponds, I mean, the, the distribution in the training and test are quite similar. So when, when there's few relevant in the test, there's also few relevant in the, in the training. But for this specific example of zebra, I guess that the, the texture feature helps a lot because like a zebra is very, has a very specific uh, texture. So because we use these LBP features, which are very good for texture uh, classification. So I guess in this case, it's like that. Yeah, it's true that putting some examples is always uh, you know, you want to show what is the experience, but on, on the other case, it's only one specific thing, and it's not really statistically uh, very significant with that. But no, examples are very good, right? But if, because you're saying the distributions are similar, but it might be that these are just outliers, right? And that's why I was curious to know, are these outliers, or in this case, I have about the same number of examples in the... Yeah, yeah, in set. this case, it is. So I guess it's more the texture thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the single, <laughs> um, on the single, single word queries, multiple versus yeah. easy and difficult. What's the overlap between how many of the easy queries are actually the single word queries, and how many of the difficult are actually the multiple word? So actually, the the e the single word queries, I guess they are all easy. <laughs> okay. But so the but easy yeah, but the easy set is much bigger than the single word query. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. So actually, one one extension of your of your work is you can actually ideally you can actually give them a picture and use that picture as a query to search for the relevant pictures, right? 
searching for. So basically, here you type in a query, right? Zebra, and you get a sequence of pictures yeah. of zebra. Yeah. Another thing you can do is just present the picture as a query. And search for the words. And, and search for, for the similar pictures, right? Ah, for similar pictures, yeah. So in this case, I guess that we would directly, uh, if we had such tasks to solve, we would, we, we can perfectly do that, but I guess that we would just train a model that would, that would just uh, take into its parameterization this specific fact. So we would just, we just have a scoring function here that would be a picture, yeah. uh, a, query, a query vector that would be a picture as well, and this uh, matrix in there yeah. would be uh, some, some square matrix of the, and we could train from similar types of constraints over yeah. some visual search yes. uh, application. Yes. So just one question is, so basically in, in this domain, probably it's just so tuned to the text kind of search engine. So that's probably the reason you want to have, you know, actual words as index, right? I, I imagine, I'm not sure if it's true, in the actual index, what you have is for every, every document, which is every uh, picture, you have a sequence of words, right? That's actually representation in the index, right? For well, every picture, I have the, I have this, w, this WP. Yeah, you have. So it's a, it's a sparse vector, but so the weights, indicate some all the confidence in yes. the term yes. for, for each term in the picture. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is the basic general framework is pretty much like the text matching framework, right? You have the invert index for every word, and yeah. you have query counting as words. Yeah. You match how many words have been matched, and you sort of compare the, the, you know, the weights, et cetera, right? Yeah, correct. So basically, it's so, so all tuned because of the infrastructure, the, you know, the text search infrastructure. People are more likely to want to search with they all have a picture in their back pocket of what they want. Yeah, yeah. That's what they can describe what they're looking for. Yes. That's right. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. What I'm saying is just one observation. Our observation is people, I mean, you actually can actually tune this pretty easily, right? I mean, even using the same infrastructure, you can actually use to solve the problem of people presenting a picture and you search for that, right? You can just transform that picture yeah. into a sequence of words, as you said, you know, sort of transpose problem, right? Yeah, we can we can do so we can do picture to picture search if we put the picture here, and we can do annotation if we yeah. invert those two. Like we yeah. we have the because exact transpose. After you train, you have this annotation, right? Yeah, you much yeah. Have that in your back pocket. But I yeah. So so the annotation would be good for tasks such as localization, as uh, John Platt was suggesting. Yeah. But otherwise, I think that most most people are doing now. Most people working on annotation are really doing it because they want to do search afterwards. Yeah. So that's why I, 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 I was proposing to do search directly. That's okay. That's yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying yeah. that's not okay. I mean, I think it's no, 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 no. no, no. It's true that you can do the converts, and yeah. I found this task more interesting. Cool. Well, awesome. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we have more meeting. <laughs> 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 we have meeting anyway. Yeah. I'm working. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have to do something?